have a few different speakers. Some are still on their way or will hopefully be joining us online. Um, but we'll start out with um, Paul Armstrong, uh, who will give a presentation on a Muslim story in the UK. Paul runs the Association of British Muslims, has worked in several fields over the years, including media, diplomacy, Muslim marriage services, interfaith, human rights, policy, countering extremism, outreach, third sector, and other community-related activities. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and God's blessings and mercy be upon you all. Um, thank you. I feel very highly honored to be invited here today to speak to you and to share something about the experience of Muslims in the UK and in relation to um, the interaction between Muslims here. I mean, not the interaction, but the actual interaction between Muslims and between the societies and cultures here. You know, it's interesting as well, um, and thank you for hosting this event and everything, but you mentioned the word civilization and how, and you know, I'm British as well, just to clarify, I'm dressed in mixed clothing, and I'll explain that in a minute. But um, I'm British, so it, I'm far from one to talk because, you know, we have a little, in, in an interesting history ourselves with your neighboring country, Malaysia, and with India. And, but in terms of civilization, when I first set foot in Indonesia, it just, you're overwhelmed by the civilization of Indonesia, by the many different cultures, by the deep, um, the way that everything in the society is imbued with spirituality, even if Indonesians themselves don't always realize it. The whole of the Pazantran system, which you have in Indonesia, that's the boarding school system for those unfamiliar with it, predates Islam. And yet it was adopted by the Wali Songo when the Wali Songo went to Indonesia. And when they developed their communities, they used a, a slightly adapted version of it as their system to teach what is called Tasawuf or Sufism, spirituality, which is the deeper essence of Islam. It's not separate from Islam. It's the spiritual aspect and essence at the root of it. And when I was in conversation with uh, Kiai Haji Mustafa Akil, he actually he explained this to me as well. I already sensed it beforehand, but he actually he clarified it perfectly and said that this is how we practice tariqa in Indonesia. He says, you learn through your sheikhs, I'm also a read of uh, Maulana Sheikh Nazim, but indirectly through Maulana Sheikh Hisham Kabani and through Maulana Sheikh Mehmet. Uh, we love and respect both dearly, and we've met before Sheikh Hassan, so it's wonderful to meet you again here. Um, he said, you learn through Sheikhs from Turkey, and from Lebanon, but what you learn is what we teach in the Pazantran system, but it is adapted to the culture here. And I agreed with him, and I said, it's true. I don't know how we would implement the Pazantran system in the UK. Although there are certainly so many aspects of it I admire and I wish we could. And I think with some thought maybe we can adapt it in some way and learn from it and adapt some elements, certainly in the sense of the self-sufficiency of the Byzantine system, which enables it to give education to communities that may not be able to afford that education otherwise. And it's raised their status. So it was interesting for me when I first visited into Indonesia in 2017 and saw this local Islam in Indonesia. And my one complaint was Indonesians always say that this is Indonesian Islam. And it is in a sense, but it is the same Islam that I learned from my teachers. This is what we call a classical Islam. And there are Sunni and Shia versions of it, and they're all 
those are considered classical Islam. They are the Islam before certain radical developments developed in the past few hundred years. And those movements were more political, more about controlling people, and more about using Islam as a tool, uh, like I said, for political agendas and for controlling people. Whereas I've always found Islam, as I've learned it from my sheikhs, I've learned it through reflect, reading and reflecting on the teachings in the Quran, as a very liberating thing. And as Sheikh Hassan mentioned, taqwa or God consciousness is the is really essential to it. It's next to the rahma, the mercy of God, is really at the heart. I said to someone earlier, I said, when I'm explaining Islam to people who don't know much about Islam, I usually start with the Kalam shahada La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, that there's no God except the God, the God of everyone, the creator of the universe. And the creator of the universe and Muhammad being a prophet in a long line of prophets and the next thing is taqwa and this understood through Rahma I said literally everything else in Islam is basically an expansion of that that is what lies at the root of Islam and so it is really troubling for most Muslims in this day and age, with the things that we've witnessed, with the things that we've experienced, uh, with seeing those World Trade Center towers destroyed on September 11th, with seeing the growth of movements like ISIS and Al Qaeda, and seeing all the destruction that they have wrought. When real Islam, in its rich diversity, is about creating harmonious societies. It is about living as good neighbors with our Jewish and Christian neighbors. It's about respecting everybody's culture and appreciating everybody. And sometimes, you know, Muslims are human. Even Muslims who are not radical, they come from a particular cultural context. And, you know, we, we have some diaspora communities in the UK and they brought their, their ideas with them. And some of them brought good ideas and some of them brought ideas that they jarred with the communities in the UK. They built mosques in styles which do not fit with the local communities, which maybe put the local communities on guard a bit because they don't understand it and they haven't done the preparatory ground to explain what is the Islam and what are they trying to achieve. And there are some Muslims who don't understand this. So, I mean, encountering Muslims in Indonesia and seeing how Indonesia already went through this over 500 years, as Gusuedi pointed out, and did it in an amazing way where so many aspects of the pre-Islamic culture, the pre-Islamic religion was preserved in a cultural way. Indonesians love the Ramayana. I love putting on the Christmas tree every year for Christmas and giving presents to my children. You know, I, I love give, having chocolate eggs and stuff for Easter. It's part of my cultural heritage. I can't take that out of me after growing up with that ever since my childhood. Uh, why should I? There's nothing wrong with it from an, a deeper understanding of Islam. But um, the only way to move forward with these things is to have like dialogues like this, bring people together and help people to understand each other. And we need to talk about, I mean, I've been involved in interfaith for many years. I embraced Islam 24 years ago. And, you know, I've been practicing in interfaith after six months. So, for 24 years. But often interfaith is just talking about easy things. 
What we need to discuss in these times is we need to come together and discuss difficult things, but set some ground rules beforehand and try to speak frankly and understand each other um, and appreciate that we've all got painful pasts. We've all got things in our past that, that didn't go necessarily as they should have gone. You know, people did things wrong, not necessarily me, but not necessarily even my direct ancestors, but people from my country, people from my community, people from other people's communities. So it's, um, it's important we face up to those things and um, talk about them frankly and try to build a better understanding. I'm going to close that there. I hope um, I didn't speak too long. No, I actually have a follow-up question. Yeah. Yes, if I may. Yeah, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about considering sort of the, you know, Britain's diversity ethnically and the different cultures and forms of Islam that are present there. What would a British form of Islam that is indigenous look like in, in your experience? Well, no, this is a very good question. I mean, I'm actually the managing director of an organization founded in 1889 by an Englishman called Abdullah William Henry Quilliam, who was a lawyer. You can really get much more English than Abdullah Quilliam. He was also quite eccentric in some ways, um, which is also very English. You know, we're known for, you know, liking things in interesting ways, having our own interesting flares, you know, and uh, hobbies and stuff. He's world famous. Um, so, that Islam was already there, and we can go back before 1889. Islam has been in the United Kingdom at least since Elizabeth I. There was even a coin going back to the 8th century, which has the Shahada on it, but that may have been because of trade or because of some of the influence. But certainly Muslims have been in England since the time of Queen Elizabeth I. And she actually had a treaty with the Ottoman Empire that if the Spanish Armada had landed, that they would have sent a liberation force. Why I, well, this isn't taught in history, I do not know, because could you imagine how that would get people thinking? Both English people, Turkish people, Muslim people, Christian people. Why was that? How was that 500 years ago, and yet we're making big problems now? So... I mean, in England has its own very unique and established culture. But we also have Welsh people uh, in Wales and Scottish people. People are, are diverse across the UK. People from Yorkshire are different from people from London. You know, we have to appreciate that diversity. Um, and then, of course, we have people who have settled in the UK from diaspora communities. Some of them came as Muslims. Some of them uh, came from other countries, like many people came from the Caribbean. Some of them came as Muslims as well. And some of them converted when they came to the UK. So we have this rich diversity within British society. And I've seen good examples of how this is handled, where everybody comes together and has very vibrant, multi-ethnic communities, multicultural communities. And I've seen really awful examples where people are just jarring against what is the, the, the culture in that area and doing things in a very weird and strange way, putting people on edge. And then of course that causes a reaction from groups such as the far right, but not just the far right. And I've had conversations even with people in the far right. In fact, one of my students is a former neo-Nazi who left all that and he, he embraced the Islam. Um, and he's very peaceful now, he's very, you know, um, he's a good person. So you see, it might not be obvious, but Islam in that case, actually, it changed him in so much of a better way from what he was doing previously. And it's like we have to move past these misconceptions. And so, obviously, establish a safe meeting place, but we can't just ignore these people. If there's an increase in far-right activism, we should legitimately ask why? What's triggering these people? That doesn't mean everything they're doing is right. And it certainly doesn't mean we agree with them. But at the same time, what's triggering them? And what I found when I spoke to these people, they were saying, well, there are gangs of Muslim men from South Asia, uh, 
India Pakistan heritage who were abusing girls and grooming them. And well, of course, they said this. I said, well, of course, that's, that's wrong. I said, that's haram in Islam. I said, and it's, it's criminal. But if people do not address these issues and accept that sometimes there are problems, and those problems are legitimate issues, and those legitimate issues, they actually have nothing to do with Islam. Although sometimes, even in that case, people were using Islam as an excuse. And some of them were saying, some of the culprits were saying, well, they are living in a non-Muslim country, and these uh, girls are non-Muslims, so they're legitimate for them to treat in this way. Now, in mainstream classical Islam, no. Absolutely no. But there are radical groups out there who believe this stuff. Just like, you know, in America they have an organization called the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan used to preach from the Bible and quote the Bible. They were Christians and they also used to kill black